Hi, I'm Eric Ryan, and I am going to do the lecture for the basically the first real hour of class, week one. And I'm recording this on the 20th of August, and my goal is to post by every Friday at 5 p.m. And I will, will normally post the written notes later if I choose to post written notes. Research shows that whenever people hear people communicate and they take their own notes, is it helps with memory. So uh, instead of reading my outline of what I say I said, because things are always a little bit different in real life, you may want to take your own notes and, and it cannot harm you at all. So I'm going to, I always start my class in person, and, and believe me, I really wish I was in person with you. I had such a great group uh, that started in January through May, and the lockdown was such that the middle two weeks of March we shut down, and I started doing online lectures on the Blackboard and on YouTube on March 24th. And I normally in my class will do at least one skit to where my students, eight or ten of them, will literally act out the facts of a famous court case. We would always do Terry versus Ohio, the stop and frisk case. That took about five minutes. And then we did 30 minutes of a hearing on a motion to suppress evidence in that case with the script really provided by the U.S. Supreme Court. And my students were the actors. And we had one play the judge and the bailiff, defense lawyer, prosecutor. And I've been doing that since the winter of 07 at SIUE. And I always felt that it's a great way to re remember things is to see your friends act them out. And not only that, it was always funny. And I do v value humor, humor in my life because I think it really enhances my life. And you'll hear more about that later. So I always post quotes on the board. And now that there is no board, I'm just going to give you the quotes. And you can think about them on your, on your own. Because whenever I've posted the quotes on the board in 13 years of teaching, I never really discuss them. So they're for you to think about. And one is by Sir Anthony Hopkins, who is one of the most famous actors in the world. He won an Oscar in 1991 for the 1990 movie, um, oh, in which he played Hannibal Lecter, The Silence of the Lambs, which is a classic book and a classic movie. And Anthony Hopkins is a wonderful man. He was uh, lately in Westworld seasons one and two on HBO, which is a great uh, kind of unusual series. And here's what he says that makes sense to me. He says, quote, life, what's better than this? Now, another quote I think you ought to think about, especially because you all will normally change your majors 3.4 times. The average undergrad student in America, as of the last study I saw about 10 years ago, changes their mind and they change their major about three and a half times. And George Eliot, I think, was a playwright, and he said this, and at age 62, it means more to me now than ever. He said, quote, it's never too late to be who you might have been. So live your life without regrets. If right now you're a, you're a criminal justice studies major and you want to be a police officer and then you see things happening around the country that may dissuade you from being a police officer, then you need to be who you're meant to be as soon as possible. So I've been teaching a long time and I love teaching as a lawyer, practicing lawyer in Belleville. It is by far the most enjoyable and rewarding thing I've ever done. I, I've noted that it helps me professionally because I'm keeping up constantly with these areas of the law in terms of new case law. And so in my class, I don't teach school here. We teach life. So we'll teach and discuss what you learn about the Constitution and constitutional individual rights and court decisions and court decisions of the Supreme Court federal appellate courts that interpret that Constitution, will also talk about these things. And I hope the variety appeals to you. History, philosophy, anthropology, evolution, psychology, sociology, parent, and how to parent children, American culture and movies. There are vast changes on the earth going on right now in American culture and politics. We're going to keep the politics out of this largely. We will talk about, for instance, police use of force issues in a very objective and dispassionate way, but in a way I, I hope that you will find interesting in, in a perspective that I hope you will appreciate from someone who's worked in the system for 37 years as a practicing lawyer, prosecutor, public defender, and defense lawyer. Uh, we'll also talk about um, evol uh, evolution, I've already mentioned that, I'm sorry, 
free and full expression under the First Amendment of the Constitution. There's a reason that First Amendment is first, and that is because it is uh, is a principle in communication called primacy. This is the first of the first ten amendments that were passed by Congress in the late 1780s and all the states, I think three quarters of the states had to approve them. And the First Amendment is very, very important and it will loom large in this case. We're gonna talk, including tonight, about natural rights of human beings. We're gonna talk about justice and what's right. We're gonna talk about morality. How many people you see on TV on these talking head shows really talk about morality and about what's right and what's wrong? And I would argue that just because the Supreme Court has its arms around some principle, we're going to go over some horrific decisions that they've made in the last 225 or 250 years, you will come to see that not all decisions are entitled to respect. And I believe on a personal level that respect is not given. Respect is earned. And we have to earn that every day in our careers and in our lives. So in addition to talking about justice and morality, we're going to talk about comedy. There's a famous quote by, I believe, the funniest man ever to live who is alive now. He's in his early 90s. His name is Mel Brooks, and he made some of the funniest movies ever made. And he said that comedy is one of mankind's defenses against the universe. And what, what Mr. Brooks is saying is that life is so hard that sometimes it helps to laugh because laughing will physically make you feel better. And many times, uh, like with the Dave Chappelle latest special on Netflix, there's so much truth in that special, not to mention his fine, fine sense of comedic timing, that we really, I, I believe that we only can get truth in a, in a few ways. Um, you can't get it from biased news sources on the right or the left. You really can't get it from most newspapers anymore. Uh, you get it in the comedy club, or you get it from documentaries. I mean, in terms of Hollywood filmmaking, documentaries are really at their peak. I think that Hollywood fictional movie making was at its peak in a few different years. 1939, we'll talk about that when I talk about my favorite movies some other time. 1979, there were incredible movies that came out then. And even 1975 was a great year for movies. But right now, we are in a, 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 we as an audience are very lucky to be able to see fair, objective documentaries. When I talk about the syllabus, we will talk about your watching documentaries, and for every hour or two of the documentary, if you watch and write a two-page paper with your takeaways from these fine criminal justice documentaries, you will receive extra credit, might as well tell you now, of 10 points per episode. But like I said, you have to email me your paper. Uh, and I'll talk in the syllabus about which ones I would suggest that you watch, but you can watch other ones if, if you like with my approval. And finally, we're going to talk about how to analyze evidence. And I mean in a fair, um, unbiased manner. And uh, we will talk about that continually. In other words, what inferences can be drawn, logical inference can be drawn from what a police officer does or what a politician doesn't say for instance. But mainly in this course, we will pursue truth, which should be the purpose of the university. SIUE, where I went, Western Illinois, where I went for law school, Southern Methodist University, Dedman School of Law. The pursuit of truth should be really the main goal and pursuit of a university, in addition to helping you become a well-rounded and caring individual. In my, is my opinion now, the purpose of education in this country should not be to indoctrinate you in conservative or liberal politics or, or be part of an agenda that does not tolerate dissent. The First Amendment says that in this country, at least as of 2020, dissent is tolerated in this, in this country or should be. So I believe that being a well-rounded human being is someone who is interesting, sharp, open to new or opposing ideas, fun, and who knows things or how to gain knowledge independently of new things and leads a balanced life. And in terms of knowing things, I have a phrase that I made up, that if you know something, you're faster than Google. Think about it. I think you'll find it's true. So today we're going to start our journey of 45 hours of content before the final by discussing my five maxims. I call them my five maxims 
of the criminal justice system. These are things that I found to be true in my 37 years of trying cases and in working daily in the courts and in writing about the criminal justice system. Now these are generalizations and I had a fifth grade teacher at Whiteside School when I was 10. I remember her name. Her name was Mrs. Buss and she wrote on the board one day something that I've never forgotten and she wrote, every generalization is false including this one. Um, now I never did have a bad teacher um, all through kindergarten, grade school, junior high, high school, undergrad, I love being an undergrad, and law school. I was blessed in that I not only had no bad teachers, but I had two master teachers, and one of them was my high school debate and drama coach, and the other one was Professor John Kennedy at SMU, who was my civil procedure and federal courts professor, and these were wonderful people uh, who are both gone now, who I try to emulate in, in my teaching. I think they've helped me. So here are my five maxims of the criminal justice system. You don't have to agree with them, but I'd like you to think about them, and, and maybe you want to email me your thoughts on, on these five. These are just my opinions, but I do have vast experience. My criminal justice career really started when my training starts, and that was in 1976 when I became an undergrad studying law enforcement administration, it was called at WIU in Macomb, Illinois. Uh, and then, of course, I enhanced my training in the criminal justice system by going to what I felt and feel now was a very good law school in Dallas, Texas, um, and, and that is Southern Methodist University Dedman School of Law. So here's my five maxims, and I'm, I'm going to state them at the top, and then I'm going to go into each one of them a little bit. Number one is there are too many laws, and the important ones don't matter. Number two is, and I heard this said last week by Senator uh, Harris running now for vice president with Joe Biden, and she basically said what I've been saying in my course for over a decade, that there are two systems of justice in this country, one for the rich and powerful and one for everybody else, and that is a great failing in our criminal justice system and has been for years. Number three maxim is that I believe that human beings act in accordance with their histories and with the forces that made them in almost everything we do. Number four is that I believe that my experience shows, especially with jurors, that a fair process yields a fair result. Here's an example. In 2016, a young man in Chicago with a knife but far away from police officers who was acting strangely or high on a street in Chicago, uh, was shot 16 times by a police officer with many other officers around who were not shooting at Laquan McDonald. Now this man, this officer, whose name I don't care about, uh, he was convicted of seven, seven second degree murder, homicide, and he is doing real time in the Illinois State Penitentiary. If you watch this tape on YouTube, which is really terrifying, and I'll tell you briefly how it starts, it starts with the dash cam of the police driving to this incident that is about to happen. So a fair process yields a fair result. And number five, here's where you come in. This system of criminal justice is one that is only as good as the people in it. I had my first uh, criminal procedure professor at uh, Southern Methodist was a man named Bill Bridges, who just lost in the last couple of years. And I remember the first day of class, he told us in 1981 or so, he said, it's not a system, it's not just, but it sure is criminal. And it's a joke, all right, he's funny about that, but like with most great comedy, there is truth in that. So let's talk about these one by one briefly. First one is there, in my opinion, there's way too many laws criminalizing behavior and the important ones don't matter. You know, important ones like prosecuting people for arson, major theft, rioting, mob action. See, I believe that after George Floyd was murdered on tape by a police officer that we see in full view in daylight, and I would call the officer's facial expression the banality of evil. I would also call the Asian American officer who was standing by when witnesses with no reason to lie to him are telling him, this guy can't breathe. 
save his life. And one, one person says, he's human, bro. They really stood out to me as, as the key phrase in that, in that whole incident. So there were law professors who a few years ago tried to figure out how many federal criminal laws there were. And when they got to 5,000, they essentially stopped counting because then they got into question of interpretation. Are large fines criminal? Um, are IRS fines criminal? So my opinion about that is the Illinois statute book when I was a young student at age 18 at Western studying these issues was about this thick. Now the Illinois state criminal statutes is about this thick and I think I have the explanation. The politicians who passed these laws in the Illinois state legislature, which I would submit to you is probably the worst legislature in the country. Let me take that back. They're the worst legislature in the history of mankind, if you count the Greeks and the Romans, is they think that by criminalizing much of stuff, like the feds did in 1994 when they made a lot of, they increased the penalties on a lot of drug crimes, is they think they benefit by that in their reelections. And that's all they're concerned with mainly is themselves in getting reelected. And I can say that in a very nonpartisan manner. So if you look at these horrific incidents that have resulted in deaths of people who were unarmed, definitely unconvicted of any crime, if you look at the reason for the stop, and this is going to be a theme of the course, Michael Brown case, Eric Gardner case, George Floyd case, George Floyd was over a stop over an allegedly phony counterfeit $20 bill. The problem with that is, where is the proof that George Floyd, if he did pass the $20 bill at a quick shop, knew that it was phony? Where is the evidence of that? In other words, I am questioning, as someone who's a libertarian, as to whether or not there was even probable cause to take that man into custody. Because I posted on Twitter, my Twitter is Ryan ESQ, which is capital R H E I N then capital E-S-Q, obviously it's at Ryan E-S-Q. I, I posted about these cases and I talked about the bullshit reasons for these stops. And I'm telling you that very few of these stops should have ever occurred at all. I'm talking about Sandra Bland too, where this cop, totally unfit for duty, wants to take her into custody over failure to signal with the turn light changing lanes. Okay, this is the first 20 minutes and I'm gonna stop now and we'll go into the next 20 minutes.